by asking each one of the panelists to please uh, introduce uh, yourselves. So maybe let's start with um, Dr. Dalal. Uh, thank you, Oriol. Good afternoon and good evening or good morning, everyone, uh, depending on wherever you are. Uh, my name is uh, Dalal Asuri. I'm an Islamic and Sustainable Finance faculty at uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University in Qatar. I am also board member of the Global Impact FinTech Forum, uh, focusing mainly on the MENA region uh, to promote digital sustainable finance. Um, thank you very much. Uh, now over to Dima. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, please introduce myself. My name is Dima. I'm the founder and CEO of Alami, uh, the largest uh, Islamic fintech lending platform uh, turned uh, digital bank in Southeast Asia, uh, focusing on SME uh, productive lending. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And well, now over to Kemal. Hi, Dr. Doriel, everyone. And uh, uh, again, good morning or, or afternoon uh, you know, to, to, to the audience. Um, my name is Kamal. Um, basically, I've, I've worked over the last 30 years uh, involved in uh, both uh, uh, as a regulator and also uh, investment banking, uh, involved in uh, Islamic finance, uh, fintech, uh, digital assets, and developing capital markets, both um, both in the Asian and also in the Middle East region. Um, um, I'm also involved uh, as a member of the FinTech Committee here in Oman of the CMA uh, in actually looking in uh, developing the FinTech market uh, uh, here in Oman. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much to all of you uh, panelists for, for introducing yourselves. And now, uh, well, we're going to start uh, our discussion per se, our panel. And for the next half hour, we're going to be discussing some relevant topics in, in this area, you know, in the area of Islamic finance and Islamic uh, fintech. Uh, I'm going to start with a very general question, uh, which I would like uh, to all of you, please uh, respond individually. But if you feel like you, you need to debate as well, feel free to do it. You know? And the idea is, um, how do you think fintech is revolutionizing Islamic finance and banking models. So over to, to any of you, whoever wants to, to start. Yeah, I think I can take that up uh, and happy to, to discuss with the rest of the panelists. Um, I think the technology uh, typically allowed uh, a business new business model. So it's a tech enabled business model uh will create a differentiation i think uh, compared to the traditional uh, or uh, islamic uh, banks or financial institutions or the incumbents uh so i think it depends on the market but for example in indonesia there are certain structure islamic structures or akats that is uh probably not that straightforward just because uh, I think operation from from the operation operating perspective, uh, it might not be easy to implement that akat fully, uh, responding to the market demands and needs, etc. Et and this is allowed by uh, the technology solution. So the the technology component uh, can potentially um, allow the the financial services company to be, I would say, um, more. Uh, uh, you know, uh, affecting the the akat or the structure in a uh, closer to the to the teachings, uh, I would say. Uh, so I think that's one. And second is obviously on the education part, right? So I think uh, Islamic finance uh, would have a very low CAC, especially for Muslim or customer acquisition costs, if the awareness is high. And with the tech enabled uh, model, uh, touching on not only social media and digital marketing, but also the storytelling of such company that will create more familiarity and connectivity with the growing millennials or even centennials. So uh, that would also helps the tech enabled business model to flourish uh, as opposed to the, to the incumbents. I think that's my two cents. Thank you. 
And uh, I think if I may add to that, um, I think Dr. Oriel, uh, looking at the global level is actually, uh, we, we noticed that FinTech has generally disrupted the financial industry in various ways and including the Islamic financial industry. Uh, and that is um, in various aspects, including the efficiency of transactions, the trustability, um, more solutions for data analysis, and then of course, promoting financial inclusion, like we've seen in the case of Indonesia and in general also promoting innovation and fund mobilization. Um, so I think th from the latest uh, Global Islamic FinTech report, the market size is about 79 billion, um, the Islamic FinTech market size, which is quite a large number. And that is projected to grow up to 179 billion by 2026, which shows actually the uh, significant development in the market and also uh, the variety of solutions across the various segments of the uh, Islamic financial industry that includes in payments, capital market solutions, insurance, social finance, deposits, etc. Um, so, and I think that has also been accelerated during the pandemic. I think Dima mentioned education, that we witnessed that personally uh, in the academic sector, uh, more solutions for edtech, for example, uh, to support also, um, and, you know, developing uh, leading courses and also to support sustainable development goals achievement, you know, quality education is one of the key objectives. And also to support, as I mentioned, um, uh, poverty eradication, and that is true financial uh, inclusion. Um, so that's broadly how fintech has been disrupting the industry. And of course, I'll leave the floor to other colleagues to um, to uh, add their opinion. Okay. Um, well, I, I think both my two colleagues have, have covered a lot of areas. But I'd like to touch upon uh, what Dr. Dalla has mentioned about uh, financial inclusion. Uh, I think that's quite key because... Um, improving financial inclusion is a key component of Islamic finance and hence uh, financial technology and uh, digitalization actually plays an important role in, in driving this uh, financial inclusion and reaching out to the society and Ummah. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the key aspects, uh, especially if you want to actually push Islamic finance uh, and, and, you know, and, and the banking sector because it provides this easy access to financial markets for all sectors of society. I mean, to put it uh, simply, um, I think both my colleagues have, uh, have touched on that. Uh, gone are the days where you actually need to physically go to a brick and mortar bank uh, to do your banking transactions, right? Um, you have all the smartphone applications. Uh, you have a robo advisory for fund management. You have a blockchain for secured contracts, both in Takapol insurance, you know. Um, you have also uh, blockchain-based tokens in order to, to actually issue uh, real estate uh, tokens or real estate organization. Um, you have artificial intelligence for portfolio allocation. So all things we, we are seeing, it, it actually revolutionized uh, Islamic finance. And, and, and last but not least, um, I think uh, uh, one of the things that we're also pushing uh, here in Oman is uh, crowdfunding fintech platforms. And we've seen how globally, how such crowdfunding fintech platforms have uh, effectively directed Sharia compliant financing or capital to socially impactful forces. Uh, and you can see this, for example, a good example in Indonesia, as uh, Pak Dima has mentioned, uh, you have Atis there, uh, which is also based here in Oman, providing you know, uh, Islamic crowdfunding uh, for all segments of society, especially this, uh, those uh, sectors in the SMEs. You, we have also Bihai, for example, in Oman. We have also Blossom, I think, also in Indonesia, which provides in a form, uh, in a P2P Islamic financing for SMEs through blockchain super. So that is actually quite uh, innovative. Um, and, 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 and thus this uh, crowdfunding fintech requirements, which we also uh, have established in Oman is, is, is very uh, attractive, you know, uh, for, for investors to come in. And that's one way to actually attract foreign direct investments uh, into, into, into Oman and also in, uh, into uh, other countries also. Well, thank you very much for sharing. You All of you actually touched upon uh, very interesting uh, topics and areas regarding the current status of Islamic uh, fintech. You mentioned financial inclusion as well, the technology. I wanted to ask you about the future of Islamic uh, fintech. What do you think the future of this area, Islamic fintech, will look like? And this is a question for all of you. So, I don't know, let's start with um, um, Dr. Al, for example.
Um, yes, <laughs> sorry. Um, no, I think it, the future looks bright to start with. So I think I mentioned the uh, projections for the industry. So uh, I think 179 billion by 2026, that's a significant number. Uh, I think a good way to look at it is to look at what have we achieved today and what are the needs and to identify the gaps which I would say that these are also opportunities for development. And I think the recent pandemic demonstrated how new niches can be actually explored to achieve more uh, impact. And uh, we mentioned uh, financial inclusion, but also sustainability impact. Um, and today, if we look at the key segments uh, in the Islamic financial industry, there are about four key segments. Uh, you have Islamic banking, the Sukuk, uh, which together represent more than 90% of the Islamic financial industry. And then about 5% will be, um, uh, you know, will comprise Islamic funds and then the takaful, which are still uh, underserved. At the same time, if we look at the innovations that we see today in terms of fintech, the majority of solutions are still focused on payments. And also, uh, for example, uh, crowdfunding, we've seen many platforms uh, globally, uh, but again, there are differences between the regions. Uh, but if you look at other segments like the capital markets or even um, um, social finance or even insurance and wealth management solutions, a lot of the markets are still underserved and still lacking innovations in this area. So there is a lot of potential uh, in all of these um, um, you know, segments uh, to actually scale up you know, uh, the Islamic fintech uh, in these regions. And that will depend, of course, on a number of, uh, uh, of factors. Uh, and the key, I would say, the key um, trends that would support this uh, mobilization, number one, is the need to um, mobilize finance and, you know, everyone is now talking about, for example, COP27 and the mobilization to mitigate climate change to and also the uh, SDG agenda, which actually it's coming to an in, uh, in a couple of years uh, where we still have a lot of gaps in actually achieving the initial um, uh, S targets under the SDG. So there is a lot of potential in leveraging on these two uh, key um, uh, like um, drivers that would be that impact equally, you know, the global financial industry and then the any national strategies uh, globally to actually promote more uh, fintech innovations um, in order to actually uh, accelerate, uh, you know, uh, impact. Thank you very much. Uh, over now can, to, to Kamal, for example. Can I Dr. Sure. Uh, sure, okay. please. Uh, very good points which uh, Dr. Dalal has raised. Um, I, I just like to look at simply, I mean, coming back to the question in terms of the future of Islamic fintech. Um, I mean, just look uh, in terms of conventional finance vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Islamic finance. Um, now, Islamic modern, uh, uh, modern Islamic finance uh, has just existed recently. I think it's more in the 1980s. Uh, conventional finance has actually existed all this while. Now, then when you look at the fintech space, um, there is, uh, again, as what Dr. Dalal uh, has mentioned, and I would echo that, that there is tremendous potential and exciting potential for this. I mean, there's a lot of catch up uh, that needs to be done, especially in the Islamic fintech space. Uh, you see the trend that we are actually moving uh, towards, uh, uh, I mean, the trend towards digitalization uh, in terms of uh, you know, the global landscape. Uh, and, and you see that there are a lot of uh, applications which is actually being used, uh, especially as, as mentioned earlier, uh, in a way the HIGMA uh, behind the COVID-19 situation actually uh, pushed more opportunities uh, towards digitalization and financial technology, uh, especially in reaching out to the masses while doing your business from home. Um, and, and that you, you can actually see in, 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 in a lot of... Uh, uh, the, the space which is actually happening. I think what needs to be done is just to ensure that we create a vibrant, uh, interconnected ecosystem, uh, which is attractive uh, for both to develop Islamic finance products and at the same time, uh, Islamic fintech. Uh, those, those are just my, my additional points. Yeah, let me uh, just uh, quickly add to it. Um, 
I think when we're talking about the future of Islamic fintech, I think we need to derive it from the future of fintech itself. So I think uh, globally, we're seeing now a lot of the fintech initiative ultimately is heading towards the digital banking play. Uh, it can be through neo banking sitting on top of a smaller bank or even getting the, their own uh, banking license, becoming a challenger bank or playing the, the payment type of you know shadow banking kind of uh, thing through through their ecosystem. So ultimately, uh, they're all going there because the economies of scale and uh, revenue from from the the biggest revenue driver will be from from the spread ultimately because crowdfunding at the end of the day is the last mile financing platform. Uh, so uh, looking at that kind of trend and also another trend uh, in in the uh, in the big market would be uh, uh, the B two C play on the banking side will come very quickly and then uh, the big all the big boys are coming in so at the end of the day now the theme is actually going to b2b banking right the the SME banking and stuff which is a more fragmented and more I would say vertically focused so looking at that trend on on the fintech industry itself now uh, how do we see it on the Islamic so there, typically there's a gap between the adoption on the conventional fintech and Islamic fintech. Uh, what I see the gap is actually getting shorter. So um, the expectation to catch up is actually there. Uh, so like, for example, for us in Indonesia, for the B2C play, uh, we were launching our digital bank called Hijra, uh, hopefully by uh, end of this year, inshallah. And the reason why we decided to go for B2C is because the uh, there's none serving the market, right? But then uh, if uh, there's like more competitors coming here, then we need to go push on our B2B side. Uh, so I think uh, the Islamic fintech uh, space going forward will more or less follow uh, the fintech industry in gen general. Now, the only thing is the differentiation, right? So I think uh, social finance is something that is close uh, and, and ingrained within the model of Islamic finance itself. And this is something that is, I think, different than the conventional finance. So this would be something that could differentiate and eventually lead to a to a blue ocean for, for Islamic fintech players and really distinct itself from the fellow uh, conventional, uh, hence the, 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 the economic benefit when it comes to the business model will, will be there. Uh, so that that's what I think. Uh, unless the Web 3.0 will will come, and that would uh, probably change the whole thing. But from Web 2.0 perspective, I think that's going to be the trend. Well, thank you very much for sharing uh, all of you your thoughts. Uh, now, th now that we covered like uh, the current status of some fintech, um, what do you think the future will look like? I think it's important as well to talk about uh, each of your respective uh, countries. Because one of the most, uh, I would say, interesting things about an event like this one is precisely the fact that each one of us either comes or is based in different countries. You know? I mean, I'm currently based in, in Spain, Kemal is based in Oman, you know? I mean, Dr. Dalal in Qatar, Dima in Indonesia. So I think this makes our debate much more interesting in this sense. And I wanted to, well, to, to talk about uh, what uh, current initiative is your your country, your respective country, working on right now in the area of Islamic finance and Islamic fintech. We all know, for example, that um, in Dubai, the IFC has been investing heavily into fintech uh, to spur the growth of the Emirates Islamic uh, finance industry. But what other initiatives each of your country is working on right now? Uh, let's start with um, well, this time Dima, for example. Yeah, I think for Indonesia, the Indonesian government uh, over the last two years uh, come up with the, the special committee to accelerate the growth of Islamic finance and halal economy called KNEKS. Um, and I think the major breakthrough that we have in the market, uh, for better or for worse, is the merger of the state-owned Islamic bank from three big banks into one bank. Uh, so the, the rationale behind that is that with better capitalization, uh, then uh, it can now serve like corporate clients, for example, which traditionally hasn't been really touched by Islamic finance. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, uh, solidifying the branding uh, for, for like one mega 
uh, Islamic Bank uh, in Indonesia. So that's one. And second is they're trying to come up with the halal uh, industrial zone as well. I think that that's still uh, in progress. And the decentralization after our reformation it also helps towards this initiative. Like we have Aceh, the, the region uh, on the north of Indonesia that implementing Islamic law within that province. So all of the banks that is non-Islamic needs to go out or convert into the Islamic banks in Aceh. Uh, now the West Sumatra is also trying to convert the, the, the regional bank that they have into Islamic uh, followed by the, uh, the two other provinces, Riau and uh, West Nusa Tenggara. Uh, so we're seeing the, the what do you call it, um, the dual approach between the central government and regional government, uh, or uh, like the US states government, is really like helpful to really push the adoption uh, and uh, building the infrastructure for Islamic finance uh, in Indonesia. On the technology side, uh, there's more and more uh, initiative. We have the Association of uh, Islamic Fintech uh, in Indonesia. Uh, there are more members coming in every year. And I think um, the alignment with the, with the ministries are there as well. So uh, like the central bank uh, come up with the Islamic uh, uh, Indonesia Sharia uh, economic uh, festivals every year, uh, supported by any other line ministries. Uh, so I think uh, what's unique in Indonesia, I think my last point is that a lot of the initiative is is actually uh, not top down, uh, but more bottom up. So I think traditionally in Indonesia is always like that so uh we think it's healthy because it's really driven by the market demand rather than the government direction but obviously if the the top-down approach works i think that that will be great and even accelerate uh, things faster thank you thank you what about uh, oman Kamal? hi oh, okay um, interesting point from Dima. Uh, well, uh, in terms of Islamic finance, uh, now Oman was one of the last starters uh, in the GCC. We only started Islamic finance in uh, basically in 2013, developing in over the last uh, nine years. Uh, but I think uh, even if you look at some of the international Islamic finance reports, I think Oman has actually uh, made a lot of uh, catch up and uh, able to learn from some of the challenges uh, uh, which has been happening in the global landscape. Um, and you would see that uh, it actually started from bottom-up approach. So again, the demand for Islamic finance came from society uh, wanting it. Uh, it was uh, not done uh, on a policy basis. So that started Islamic finance. Uh, but at the same time, looking at the fintech side, uh, that's also a top-down approach whereby there are policies uh, in place and that's where we have the, um, uh, the uh, Oman Vision uh, 2040 and also the uh, Oman uh, 2030 Digital Strategy, which is actually encouraging digitalization and innovation uh, for the country. So those two are the key roadmaps in, in wanting to pursue this further. So while you have Islamic finance, which was actually came up from the demand from the people themselves, then, but at the same time, uh, yes, some policies have been put in place. And in order to push that further in terms of the FinTech side, uh, that's where you have both the two roadmaps, Oman Vision 20 and Oman uh, 2030 Digital Strategy. Uh, now, where it comes in and it's relevant to, because at the end, I mean, Islamic finance fintech uh, cannot actually operate, uh, you know, in silos. So you need to connect it back to the economy, you know, and that's where it plays a major role in actually developing the economy and society. And you've seen uh, as part of the diversification program in the GCC, for example, uh, again, because there were the, the oil crisis where the, when prices were down. So I think all GCC countries were looking at diversification. And, and one of the key aspects uh, uh, also was, it was one of the strategies here in Oman. Uh, certain factors 
a certain sectors that we diverse we were trying to diversify away from oil looking at manufacturing tourism logistics uh, uh, fisheries mining and uh, and all that so so when you diversify the economy that includes building up the large sme based entrepreneurs here in oman within those economic sectors uh, and then spreading the wealth to all segments of society and hence promoting financial inclusion so and that's where islamic finance both be it both conventional and islamic finance plays a major role in try, trying to provide that alternative financing platform for these businesses to flourish especially the smes and that's why we are trying to actually uh, 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 basically uh, develop that base so um, uh, we've introduced and one of the key aspects and and that's where i i may differ with i think what uh, dima has mentioned whereby well, we have introduced one of the key things, which is crowdfunding and, and pushing towards Islamic crowdfunding. Uh, I would not say it's a last mile because um, it's, 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 it's actually one of the ways in order to provide that alternative financing platforms for companies, especially com small companies like SMEs, to raise their funding. Yes, you may have banks, digital banks, uh, but then again, uh, this provides an alternative financing platform for for these companies to actually gain access directly to investors without having to go in, uh, through a banking intermediary, whether, whether it's conventional or digital banking. So those are the things that we've introduced in, in, in place, uh, especially we were pushing towards uh, crowdfunding. And in terms of rules, uh, I would uh, say, and because we've done our benchmarking when we actually introduce it, it's actually the first in the GCC to allow global cross-border fundraisings and investments within the GCC. Uh, where certain countries still do not allow that uh, within the GCC. Um, and, and through that, uh, we are also looking at also regulating certain extent virtual and digital assets, because that could also be another way in to provide an alternative financing platform. For example, real estate tokenization, which I've just mentioned, in order to raise funding for real estate development. Uh, and for social financing, that could be addressed through crowdfunding, whereby I mean, for example, Ethis has a global sadaqa uh, platform, you know, which which actually relates to social financing also. Um, so, so these are the things that that we are currently doing here in Oman, Aurel. Thank you, Kamal. And well, uh, last but but not least, uh, what about Qatar, Dr. Dalal? Um, yes, actually, uh, uh, Islamic fintech is a strategic focus area in Qatar as well. And we've noticed that in the recent ranking, actually, of countries with more than one billion, um, you know, um, dollars market size in terms of Islamic fintech, where actually uh, Qatar ranks among the eleven top countries. Um, and, and the drivers for that have been actually has been the mobilization, you know, um, across four key, uh, I would say, pillar areas. So number one is really to create that conducive environment uh, for fintechs to develop their uh, business and also to scale it up. And that includes uh, the funding aspect, but also the mentoring aspect. So there are various incubation, acceleration programs to promote you know, um, the uh, Islamic fintechs development and also to support them in scaling up their activities. And um, among the incentives, for example, um, 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 we have, for example, the Qatar FinTech Hub, uh, which supports, you know, the uh, expansion of local and international FinTech. So for, I, for the first cohort of the uh, Qatar FinTech Hub, for example, included 24 FinTechs with 11 in the incubator and 13 for the accelerator program. Um, and for example, qualified fintech, let's say applying for a Qatar Financial Center business license would be eligible for waiving both their application fees and also their first year renewal fees, um, as well as a complimentary access to, um, to there's a fintech circle at the Qatar Financial Se Center where basically a fintechs can um, have the opportunity to benefit from a number of facilities to develop their uh, activities. Uh, so there's a dedicated internal team that supports, for example, um, um, fintechs in terms of market and investor access under the Qatar Fintech Hub. 
And the second pillar would be actually access to talent. And, you know, this is one of the key challenges globally, not only for the Islamic financial industry, but for the global fintech industry as well. And I think here the role of, um, for example, the private market uh, organizations, but also academic institutions is very critical in this regard. And I think um, at HBKU, we've been pioneer in terms of um, uh, revisiting, for example, our uh, Islamic finance programs to integrate dedicated uh, electives, or modules to fintech, and also to integrate some of these considerations that we have been discussing, um, you know, across the different courses, for example, at the programs, but also to expose students to latest developments, either in their research or also in terms of the interaction with the industry. Um, in terms of the market awareness, as you know, we have recently established a gift chapter in Qatar, and that would be mainly focusing on the uh, promoting digital sustainable finance uh, in the region. But we have also launched a gift uh, uh, research working group, which would be kind of the research arm of gift. And the idea is that to also promote awareness and uh, capacity building for uh, both market, private market institutions, but also among policymakers to create more awareness in terms of Islamic finance development and also, uh, you know, to promote innovation. And the third pillar would be to actually, you know, supporting that innovation awareness pillar is really to promote the development of an engaged customer base. And that is to ensure the sustainability of Islamic fintech startups, which will depend, of course, on um, enhancing, uh, for example, security issues, user convenience, customer-centric innovations, etc. And finally, uh, to promote more partnerships so that um, that is to support actually fintech scale up their businesses. And I think I do. Uh, we do have the same trend as I think Dima mentioned the uh, consolidation of the Islamic uh, banking segment. We witnessed that as well in the Qatar with two recent mergers uh, between you know conventional Islamic banks. So that creates better capitalized institutions, and that would also support you know collaboration between financial institutions and also, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, fintechs. Uh, and finally, I think also to promote partnerships, we have created an Islamic uh, finance task force at the level of the Qatar Financial Center. And the idea is to bring together the key stakeholders in the country and then to promote innovation to, you know, further develop, for example, um, capital markets. You know, one of the key issues in general in the GCC is the underdeveloped capital markets. So we're looking to use fintech as an enabler, for example, for the development of Islamic capital markets. Um, I think I'll stop here. There are more to, things to share, but just for the sake of time. Well, um, thank you very much for sharing. And given that we only have like two more minutes before uh, finishing this panel, I would like to ask you one final question, which I don't think you are going to be able to, well, to, to solve like each one of you individually. So maybe just one or two panelists should focus on this one max. And I want to talk about technology. Uh, how do you think Islamic finance and banking can leverage the use of technologies like blockchain or artificial intelligence? So uh, whoever wishes to reply, uh, please in one, two minutes or max. Uh, I don't know. Any, anyone taking this up? <laughs> okay. If, if not, I'll 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 go ahead first. Uh, but perhaps uh, you know, Dima's working in the industry and Dr. Dalal uh, could actually add then further. Um, just coming to your question, uh, Oriel, about uh, uh, sorry, was it uh, how do you think Islamic finance and banking can leverage the use of technologies like blockchain? Well, yes. uh, on the capital market side, uh, we've seen a lot of applications uh, from players. Uh, particularly uh, on fund management, on the issuances of uh, I mean, fixed income uh, coming in to, to actually introduce uh, certain unique products. Um, uh, because uh, at the same time, we are going to introduce a form of a fintech sandbox uh, here also in, in Oman. Uh, so, uh, for example, some of players were actually coming in to, to actually uh, using artificial intelligence to introduce a form of robo-advisory uh, when actually dealing with the clients in, 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 in their fund management business, uh, especially uh, portfolio allocation. So it, it was quite interesting to see all this. 
um, as a regulator here, you know, man, we regulate we regulate both capital market and also the insurance sector. Uh, and uh, you're looking at uh, you know uh, certain applications being used, especially for the takapul side, um, introducing uh, smart and secured contracts automatically uh, through applications for you know insurance and takapul, which is which is uh, actually uh, some of the things that the marketplace are looking at. Um, at, at the same time, having blockchain to enable uh, a, a secure transaction uh, and, and also smart contracts for crowdfunding, uh, that's one of the key areas that, that, that some of the players are also looking at. Um, and, in the, and also on the other side of it, which relates to payment system, so the question of uh, CBDC, CBDCs, you know, central bank digital currencies being used, uh, as a form of payment, that's something that is being explored, especially for investment or payment to merchants. I think that's, those are the, some of the things that, that we've, we've been seeing uh, within the industry here in Oman. Um, and I, I believe that's, that's also happening globally uh, outside in, in some of the areas, both uh, on, on Dr. Dalal or Dima's side. Uh, so I, I'll let them ex uh, expand that further. Well, um, thank you very much, Kemal, for sharing your thoughts. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. We are uh, reaching the end of this panel. So okay. I would like to thank uh, all of you for participating in this panel, Dr. Dalal, Dima and Kamal. And also I would like to thank, of course, uh, all the audience for listening to us. I hope you got to learn as much as I did by listening to our esteemed uh, panelists. And well, um, if you have like any further doubts, uh, feel free to, to write them on the chat box.